As you know, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 uh, cites the fruit of the Spirit, and the Word says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. Now when I began to uh, go into this series, I thought, well, I may just do all, uh, all of the fruits of the Spirit, but uh, the Lord just really just laid three of them on my heart. And the third one, the first one was love, the second one was peace, and the third one is kindness. What does our society, society need now? Well, I think they need some kindness, don't you think? I found a couple of quotes that I really liked. I did not, uh, it was just kind of anonymous. Uh, uh, no one really knows where they came from, but I really like it. And it says, kindness makes a person attractive. If you would win the world, melt it, don't hammer it. So be kind. And then the second one is, small things done with great love will change the world. Small things done with love will change the world. Of course, we talked about love a few weeks ago as we, we defined love as this, God is love. So if we exhibit the love of God, then that can definitely change the world. But one of the saddest trends that I see in our society and mainly in our country, because that's where I live, in our town, that's where I live and reside, is that people don't know how to be kind to one another anymore, it seems like. You ever been in one of those situations uh, on the road and you're traveling and somebody with road rage comes and gives you all kinds of signals? I've been there. They'll beep that horn at you and, and they're just angry and you can read their mouths and you can tell that they're not saying some pretty, they're not saying kind things to you. But we also find it within our politicians, they have this shove it mentality. You know, I want it, you know, have whatever I want, I'm going to do it, it doesn't matter. Uh, what anybody else thinks. Athletes, you know, you have your athletes and baseball brawls and fights and basketball games, and you have all of that kind of stuff. Your media, they have the story first, no matter, uh, no matter who it hurts. And so a lot of unkind things that are uh, going on uh, in our world. And I believe that our society does feel really bad. There's a lot of people that feel really bad that need to be encouraged. Uh, through kindness. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that tonight, and I want, I want us to think about human kindness and how important it is. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the book of Jonah real quick because I want you to uh, see something. Um, I want you to see a way not to be, okay? I mean, you could look on the board there, and it says, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. In other words, God had told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. So he went the opposite direction, and God brought up this fish, this great fish, to swallow him. You remember the story, he goes down deep, and he's in there for three days and three nights, and the, the, the great fish uh, vomits him out upon the, the, the beach, and he runs to Nineveh. And he realizes that as he gave that, that five-word speech, that five-word sermon, repent, you've got 40 days to repent, and, and there are, if you don't, God's going to do something. Well, they did repent, and uh, God relented, and God spared them. And it said this in chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He, see, he didn't like the, the Ninevites. They were a vicious people. He, had, he didn't have any kindness in his own mind, in his own heart for them. So he... Uh, he became, he became angry, the Bible says. And so he prays to the Lord and he says, Oh Lord, was, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and you're abundant in loving kindness. So he realized God was, was full of kindness, loving kindness, and he also realized that God was one who would relent from doing harm to them. And then this next verse is the one, man, you're talking about an attitude problem. He said, therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Wow. Can you imagine a prophet of God being that, that um, so displeased with a, with a country that God had told him to go and preach the word, and because they repented, 
He said, God, it'd be better for me just to die. Well, folks, that's not the way we need to be. Everybody that we come in contact with, we need to be showing kindness. Now, I want you to... Uh, I did, I did a little exercise with some kids, and I, I contacted my uh, two oldest grandsons, Braxton and Beckett, and I asked them the question, what is kindness? What does kindness mean? And Braxton gives this very short answer. He says, it's God's love. And I, you know, for a four-year or a five-year-old now, that's, that's pretty, that's deep. And then Beckett he gives a pretty good soliloquy. He gives a pretty good uh, story behind it. He said, now, Pops has said, it's when you're mean to somebody and you turn around and you apologize to them. You know what? I thought that was pretty good too. I'm thinking maybe we need to learn a few things from, from our kids. And he also said, it's when you say excuse me. And I'm thinking, wow, Ryan, you and Corey are teaching them manners. I appreciate that. But some other kids said, saying goodbye in a nice voice. Another one said, hugging real gentle. Another said, thank, saying thank you. Another child said, don't hit another people. <laughs> I like that vernacular there. Another said, Say, saying excuse me when you bump into someone. Another said, saying I'm sorry. Another one said, and this was a four-year-old, said help others when they make mistakes. That's deep. And then one said, sharing the popcorn at the movies. <laughs> That's being really nice. And then one said this, and this is the last one, said, you don't have to do something hard to be kind. All it takes is a simple act of kindness. Out of the mouth of babes, folks. Maybe a whole lot of adults need to, to be listening to some of that. Well, back years ago, there was a Special Olympics event, and nine runners were waiting for the start of the 100-yard dash. And the gun sounded, and off they went. And as these nine runners started, one of them fell right out of the gate and fell and hurt his knee, and he just stayed there. But what was so significant about that event was the other eight stopped. They turned around, and they looked, and they saw that he had fallen. And all eight of them went back to him. One of the little girls knelt down and kissed him on the knee and says, Now you'll be okay. They stood up together, all nine of them, and locked arm in arm, and they walked across the finish line to the cheers of all of the, the uh, people in the, all the spectators. Now that is an example of kindness, going back and doing something for someone else. And our society's hurting. Maybe it's time we slow down. Maybe it's time that we come to a stop. Maybe it's time we turn around and we look and we notice uh, the things that people are going through, and maybe we can show them kindness to help make them feel better. Now, if you have a sheet there, you're going to note there's four points to this message tonight, or this lesson tonight. And um, I come up with what I thought was the best act of kindness, and then the second one sounded like the best act of kindness, and the third one did too, and the fourth one. So they're all best acts of kindness, okay? So uh, just, just uh, take it like that. And uh, I think all of them are very, very important and very powerful. But the first one is this. The best act of kindness is to bring someone to Christ. Agreed? Do you say, if you agree with that, say amen. To bring someone to Christ. I'm going to invite you to turn to Mark, Mark chapter 2. One of the great stories that we find uh, from the, uh, from the uh, ministry of Jesus. And it says here in verse 1, And again he entered Capernaum, and after some days... And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? 
Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed, and they glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, I'm not going to go in depth of that, that particular story. There's so many different directions we could go. But I want, you to, I want you to note in that that there were four men that made a difference in one person's life. Those four men saw that it was crowded. They saw that there was an amazing crowd that had packed the house. Matter of fact, they had, they had, uh, people had heard that, uh, about Jesus' miracles and they wanted to see it for themselves. And so they, they would follow him wherever he went. And so as he was in this house, they came and it was such a crowd, we call it standing room only. Well, these men had an idea. These four men had an idea. We've got to get him to Jesus. And so they walk up the steps on the side of the house and they go up and they pull back the roof. A lot easier to do it in that day than it would be today. But they went and they pulled back the, the grass, the whatever it was they had on top, and they made a hole and they lowered this man down to Jesus. Why did they bring this man to Jesus? Well, not only was it because they had love for Jesus in their heart and knew Jesus could do something, but they were kind people. Have you ever just met somebody that was just really, really kind? Isn't it great to be around people like that? They're very encouraging, and uh, they just do kind things all the time. They're nice. Well, these men were that way. And you see, this man had never walked in his life. This man had never been independent. He had to depend upon somebody his whole life. But this man had at least four people who cared enough, and they showed him that they cared. How many times do you show people you care? Because you have a kind heart. Well, this act of kindness really touched the heart of Jesus. Don't you know that that's what happens when you're kind to somebody? It touches the heart of Jesus. And don't you want to do that every day? Well, in verse 5, Uh, this act of kindness prompted Jesus to compliment these men. Jesus didn't let it go. He didn't overlook what these men did. He he said, look at verse 5, he said, Jesus saw their faith. So he complimented them for stepping out on faith and doing something for this man. But not only did it prompt him to compliment this man, man, or these men, but it also prompted Jesus to heal the man that they brought to him. And in verse 5 it says that, Jesus healed him spiritually. It says there, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now that's the greatest healing that there is, right? And when you bring somebody to Christ, you are are changing their life spiritually. You are allowing the Spirit of God to touch their life and to convict their heart. And so Jesus, he healed him spiritually, but in verse 11 it says he healed him physically. He said, get up, take up your bed and walk. And you can imagine what was going through the mind and the heart of that man that had been a paralytic all of his life. But because four men brought him to Jesus, he was changed. But I noticed something else in verse 12. This act of kindness prompted something else. It prompted excitement in the crowd. Notice what it says in verse 12. He arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all so that they were amazed and they glorified God and here's what the rest said, we never saw anything like this. <laughs> they'd, never been, they'd never seen that kind of act of kindness in their life. And how Jesus healed this man. Turn, turn with me to the book of Titus. The book of Titus, chapter 3. I've got to hurry here. But when the, verse 4, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
Now, verse 8 is the main verse here. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you uh, to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, because these things are good and profitable to men. You being kind is profitable to men. You bringing somebody to Christ will profit their life. So one of the best acts of kindness is to bring someone to Christ. So what did society need that day? Did they need uh, someone to control the crowd? No. Did they need someone to repair the roof? No. No. What they needed was seeing somebody doing a kind deed and bringing someone to Jesus. Well, the second thing is, and I'm going to have to hurry, the best act of kindness is not to be judgmental. And if we're all honest, we have been judgmental at some point in our life, have we not? One of the most detrimental things I think you can do in life is to judge other people. And I'm not talking about fruit inspection and things like that. I'm talking about having an attitude of of being judgmental and and, and downing people and things like that. Well, after a church service, a little boy, and I've I've shared this this one with you before, but I thought it went well with this. A little boy told his pastor, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money. Well, thank you, said the pastor. But he said, why? Because my dad says you're one of the poorest preachers we've ever had. Well, that's pretty judgmental. That's being judgmental. That's not being very kind. Well, we find a story in John chapter 8 that of an incident that's not very kind. And let me read these first 11 verses to you. <laughs> but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. By the way, Jesus is there uh, teaching in the temple, and where where he's actually teaching is is, uh, a place, uh, a court of the women. You just have to go, we don't have time to go through all that. But the, these Pharisees and these religious leaders knew exactly where Jesus would be. And so they were going to bring this woman, and they did. They brought her, and they had caught, said they had caught her in the act of adultery. Now Moses, in verse 5, says, In the law commanded us that uh, such should be stoned. But what do you say? And of course, they're trying to trap Jesus, and Jesus is the wisest, and, you know, they're not going to trap him. He said this, testing them, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And I'm not going to speculate what he wrote, folks. The Bible doesn't say. Okay? But whatever it was, it, it challenged their hearts. We do know that. Again, he stooped down, verse 8, rolled on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? And has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And sin, no more. So Jesus is appearing. He's appearing in the temple. He is teaching there. Uh, He was interrupted by this other crowd that erupted into uh, the lesson, into the court. And it was not just an ordinary crowd that erupted into there. It was an angry mob, these religious leaders. They had what I call fierceness in their eyes. They had anger in their eyes. They had hate all over their face. They were elegantly dressed. They looked powerful on the outside. They, were well, they had well-trimmed beards. They had these flowing robes. They were, if you will, the Supreme Court of that day. And so they dragged that woman through the street. And as Brother Mike preached on a few weeks ago, where was the man? 
Why didn't they bring him as well? They were many. Well, let me say this. They were in power. She was a victim. They were many. And she was alone. They were self-righteous. She was humiliated. They were mean. But Jesus was kind. You know, that to me is one of the most powerful stories about being judgmental that, that you'll read in all of the Word of God. Let me t- turn to 1 Corinthians 13. You, you know this passage. It talks about love and kindness. and It's the love chapter as we know. Verse 4 begins, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. I believe those men, those religious leaders, behaved rudely that day. That does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So folks, the best act of kindness is to not be judgmental. But number three... The best act of kindness is to meet people at their need. And I think you probably know where I'm going with this. If if you study the Bible, uh, you've read this story many, many times. Uh, We find it in Luke chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse number 30. And um, we need to read this again just to remind us that there are people that have needs. And there are people that are in bad situations, and we need to be kind to these people. It says, Jesus answered and said, after, after uh, he is uh, being tested by these lawyers, uh, he said in verse 30, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. This is that lawyer. Then Jesus said to him, go and do do likewise. What a powerful story. One of those uh, stories that you never forget. It never leaves your mind after you learn of this particular story. And we note that there was a man that did fall among thieves. They stripped him. Uh, They beat him. They left him for dead. A priest comes by. He just walks by. A Levite comes by. He takes a look. Just walks on by. But then a Samaritan. Samaritan and Jews really didn't get along. They really didn't like one another. But this Samaritan, because he had a kind heart, came and made a difference in this person's life. Can you imagine... When Jesus was telling that story, all of the uh, embarrassment on that lawyer's part. He had to be embarrassed. He had to be convicted of his own heart. You know, that, man, that's what I really need to do. And folks, when we see people in need, that's what we need to do. We don't need to just walk by. We don't need to just take a look. We need to show kindness. It may be a word of kindness. It might be a deed of kindness. But some form of kindness is what we need. And I know that we have a lot of what we call panhandlers around, and and, uh, every now and then I do give some money because the Spirit prompts me to do that. But other times I've just been convicted to share a word with them or hand them a Bible, I'll hand them a testament or something, some act of kindness because that's what the Spirit of God prompts us to do. Well, Jesus said, go and do the same. Look at Galatians again, Galatians chapter 6, 
verse 9 and 10. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Not only people outside of our church family are we to be kind to, but people within our church family we are to be kind to. And so an act of kindness is when you're uh, meeting people at their need. And then the fourth one is this. The best act of kindness is to display Jesus. Do you want to show Jesus? I'm telling you, Jesus was compassionate. Jesus was kind to everybody. Now, he would get wrangled at the the Pharisees and Sadducees every now and then, but he still loved them. And he still wanted them to come to a saving knowledge of who he was. So in John chapter 13, look at John 13. We'll be wrapping this up just a second. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. In other words, they'll know you're a disciple of Christ if you're displaying Jesus within your life, if you have love for one another. And then that great verse in Ephesians, you know it, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So that's a direct command. Be kind to one another. There was a a poem that, that I came across many, many years ago. And this poem is simply entitled, Too Late. In this world of hurry and work and sudden end, if a thought comes quick of doing kindness to a friend, do it that very minute. Don't put it off. Don't wait. What's the use of doing a kindness if you do it a day too late? So each day you get up, you have a conversation with Jesus, you have your special time with Jesus, and then you tell Jesus, I want to show you today. I want to put you on display today. I want to be kind to people today. I want to show love today. I want to show peace that I have in my heart today because of what you have done in my life. And I'm going to close with 2 Peter chapter 1. It's after 1 Peter, isn't it? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. It always comes back to love, does it not? It began with love, and it comes back to love. Verse 9, or excuse me, verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Folks, it's going to make a difference in life, in your life and other people's life if you'll just show kindness. Amen? Amen. So what's our society need? Well, they need the love of God. They need peace. Peace. Not just peace from war. They need peace from the war that's going on inside of their life. The Bible says they are a em- uh, lost person is an enemy of God. And they need the peace they can have with God. And then let's show them kindness. And let's, let's make a difference. And let's show people that we care.